Amelia, just give us the cue. We're ready. All right. Well, everybody, welcome uh, to the uh, Ballot Access Modernization Committee. Today's April 21st, uh, 2022. Uh, why don't we just start off? My name is Paul Lopez. I'm the clerk and recorder for the City and County of Denver and the Chief Elections Official for the County. I'll have my co-chair, Councilman Kendra Black, introduce them herself, and then we'll uh, have folks introduce themselves on the call real quick. Good afternoon. I'm Kendra Black, and I'm a city council person representing Southeast Denver District 4. Uh, panelists, do you want to um, introduce yourself, starting with uh, Ms. Ozels? Sure. Uh, Jenna Ozels. I am uh, currently the state director at a group called Colorado Labor Action and have worked um, on electoral campaigns within Denver and Colorado for over a decade. Awesome. Thanks. Hey, everyone. Amanda Sawyer, Denver City Councilwoman representing District 5, uh, East Central Denver. Thanks for having me and thanks to the panelists for being here today. I'll jump in next. I don't know what order is on everybody's screen. It's different, I guess. Uh, Kevin Flynn, Southwest Denver District 2, Denver City Council. Hi, I'm Stephanie O'Malley. I'm the Associate Vice Chancellor for Government Relations and Community Affairs for the University of Denver and the former Denver County Clerk and Reporter. Hi, Bianca Emerson with Colorado Black Women for Political Action. Sky Stewart, Deputy Chief of Staff for Mayor Hancock's office. I work on legislative issues uh, and state legislative issues on behalf of the office. David Broadwell, I was former Assistant City Attorney for 20 years and uh, uh, also a long tenure with the Colorado Municipal League. I'll jump in real fast. Um, Steve Bond, finance manager in the city and county of Denver's budget office. Troy Bratton from the city attorney's office. I am Audrey Klein, director of public affairs for the clerk and recorder's office. Um, Ms. Dawson, you want to introduce yourself? Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry. Um, apologize for joining late. Dina Dawson, uh, Director of the Elections Division for the Office of the Clerk and Recorder. Yeah, and Mr. Steyer. Hey, yeah. Hey, everyone. I'm Ben Schler, the Policy and Compliance Administrator for the Clerk and Recorder's Office. All right. So it looks like we have a lot of our folks here. Now, there are folks that are that serve on another commission statewide, and they, they are not able to be here on this call, but they will be submitting their comments. Know that uh, for the folks in the public, we will have a public comment period that's uh, 15 minutes um, at the end of, of this particular meeting. Although know that your comments are welcome and your input is absolutely welcome. Your questions are absolutely welcome. Um, in a written, uh, um, I was gonna say manera in Spanish and in writing. Uh, and I think it's, you know, you just, uh, if, if, you, if, you, if you can, just send that to us. Um, we will receive it. We respond to it. We take that into account. It's very important. Uh, this is a public process, so we want to make sure that that voice is heard. We have a um, pretty tight agenda, um, and I just want to kind of go through just uh, the, the quick agenda. We're going to do a, a re review of the last meeting. Um, I have items identified for discussion today, which I'll turn over to uh, Councilman Kendra Black um, to review a few of the uh, issues identified by Councilwoman Black. Um, we'll talk about the booklet, uh, our municipal information booklet, uh, petition transparency. Uh, we'll have a committee discussion for future agenda items. Now know that uh, we have one more band meeting after this, um, and then we'll have uh, public comment period and then we'll adjourn. Um, with that, um, Amelia, do you want to pull up the first set of slides? I think the councilwoman's actually running the slides. Too. Oh, that's right. Oh, yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, Councilman Black, I apologize. Go for it. Okay, so I'm just off and running. 
Okay, tell me if you can see my slides. Yep, yes. Okay. Um, okay, I'm, I'm going to go um, quickly through some of them so we have some time to talk about some of the other ones. So, um, so this was just, again, the problem statement we've had on all of our presentations. And this is just a reminder of the issues that were identified in the 2021 election that we've been talking about for these past meetings. Um, and for today's discussion, I just wanted to remind everyone sort of where I'm coming from. So um, there are three council members on this group. And the reason why is because many of the actions that um, might be recommended are actions that council will have to take as a legislative branch. So we have um, budget and policy committee meetings scheduled. Um, in May and June when council members will discuss uh, any of the recommendations that this committee makes. So to facilitate those discussions that council will be having, um, my goals for today are just to confirm and clarify uh, this group's support for certain recommendations already discussed, um, discuss some other various ideas that have been suggested to me by BAM members, and then determining if there's consensus on these ideas. And if there's not consensus, that's fine. Um, and any uh, discussions or comments, I will for sure share with all of the council. Um, I am a little disappointed that we're missing three of our members today, um, Mark Gruskin, Karen Goldman, and Martha Tierney, who are all experts in this field. So unfortunately, they're not with us today. Um, but I do think I'll check in with them after this meeting. Um, they all said they would watch the meeting and then maybe they will provide feedback after that. Um, so uh, with the suggestion from uh, my fellow council members, I just cr created this quick table and I just kind of wanted a thumbs up from council or from BAM members. Um, just so I can be clear on if you are in favor of this recommendation or not, or it needs more discussion. And some of them I think I know, but I just really wanted to be clear on this. So um, the first one we talked about initially was just adjusting the way initiatives and referred measures are numbered. And the clerk um, has offered to uh, make that adjustment on their end. Um, it doesn't require any council action, but just to confirm, I just want uh, you know a thumbs up from this committee. And I actually can't see all of you. Um, Ian, ha you have your hand up. Is that a thumbs up or do you have a question? Actually, I have a question about that one. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I am in I'm in favor of this after hearing the conversation, but I'm really most interested in what the timeline is going to really look like having a ballot initiative on this November. I was recently told we might not know until August what the numbers will be and then that's just really challenging when it comes to printing and fairness for outreach for people. Um, into this cycle and then obviously it, it wouldn't be an issue probably after this cycle and so I just wanted to raise that because I heard it in a meeting yesterday and. It, we, you know, we're, we're at the place where we're like, we assumed we would have been 300, of course, and um, I'm not sure why it would take until August to figure that out. Um, Clerk Lopez, do you want to respond to that? Actually, let me uh, shoot it over to Dina, because we, we went through a whole process on timelines. And now we've, we've actually sent a timeline for folks to be able to scope it out. Dina, do you want to um, chime in on that? Sure. I think, Ian, you're referring to, I think we've had some conversations with our ballot access manager and compliance. I'm sorry, ballot access coordinator and compliance about the ballot numbering. So this is not anything new. This, I, If I'm understanding you right. Um, so this would actually be a compliance issue for Ben. If that's what I'm understanding, you're asking about the the one petition initiative petition from last year that you know is going to be on the November ballot and what the number is going to be. 
Yeah, and if we weren't changing the petition process, we probably would be 300 because we were the first one that was certified, or at least Got that's it. how it's been in all these other ballot initiatives I've worked on. And mm -hmm. we're at a place where we're preparing for outreach and we want to buy banners. And would you wait till August and you do union printing? It can take five or six weeks along with the other ballots that are moving forward. And so, yeah. Yeah. So I'm in favor of it. I get it. At first, I wasn't. After hearing the conversation, I'm cool with being 314 or whatever end up right. number it ends up being. You know what I mean? I just, I don't want to say yes to this now and then it drag on for months and make it difficult for those that are on the ballot now. That makes perfect sense. So you're really just wondering, are we going to be 300 or are we going to be 305? Like depending on if the numbering is changing. Correct. Okay. So I, I think um, depending on the approval for this number changing thing that the clerk's office and working with our city attorney's office have drafted an ordinance to be able, I'm sorry, to be able just to make that change. So once the determination is made, um, so speaking of the timelines of when Ian would know if they're gonna be 300 or 305, that's through this process, so. Well, this, this does mm -hmm. not require an ordinance. So this is just something the clerk's office has agreed to do, so. It's Thank really you, Troy. I see that you popped on to be able to speak to that. Yeah. Yeah, I just I just want to make sure we're clear about what we're talking mm -hmm. about. Um, there, there are really two separate issues. There's one that Ian's referring to about uh, repeating the numbers. Sorry, I'm looking to the side. I got a couple of different mm -hmm. things. There's the issue that Ian's talking about uh, repeating the numbers. That's something we can just do. Um, mm -hmm an ordinance for, but also in your line item on the slide there, Councilwoman Black, um, it refers to referred measures. And if we are going to adjust how we number uh, referred measures on the ballot so they don't appear intermingled with council referred measures like they did last time, then that does require an ordinance change. And we do have a draft of that that basically just brings the um, Secretary of State's ballot numbering rule into our code and then creates a new section for um, measures that are referred by the citizens. So I just wanted to clarify the, the two issues there. The referred measure one does need an ordinance change, but um, just not repeating the numbers. That's something the clerk's office can just start doing. Okay, we are going to talk about the referred measures later in the presentation. So um... Go ahead, Councilwoman Sawyer. Happy to talk about it later. I just was gonna, um, I had a follow-up question for Troy. Um, if this is gonna, you know, get a thumbs up from uh, the members of our panel, then is that something that you can send over the language for? Because that, if it seems like that is um, a pretty straightforward change that no one really uh, has concerns with as long as it's clear. So, you know, that's the kind of thing that could be discussed at our first budget and policy meeting and moved forward relatively quickly, but we would need to see the language on that and haven't seen anything yet. Yeah, absolutely. I've put some drafts together for the clerk's office and we've kind of compiled some and separated some out. So um, that that's why you haven't seen it yet. It, but um, yeah, that is something that if the clerk is good with, I can absolutely kind of pull apart from the other stuff and and give it to you guys to see. Or That'd be awesome, just because absolutely. I wasn't aware until today. I, not that I wasn't aware, but didn't really think about it because uh, you know, I'm I'm not running a citizen um, or initiated ordinance, but um, I think Ian brings up a really good point that um, you know we want to make sure that this is a fair process, and so let's um, yeah let's see if the, if that's not contentious at all, uh, let's take it to council as soon as possible and get that moved forward so that we can um, you know help out the citizen initiated ordinances that are that know that they're on the ballot already and are are ready to go. Yeah, and that's the one that doesn't require um, any ordinance change. But, you know, I, I, I just want to be clear on that one, too, that kind of like Dina was saying, you, we may not, I mean, the clerk's office, the elections division can get a lot of initiatives in at once and it can, you know, some can be easy, you know, faster to verification than others. So I'm not sure that the clerk's office really releases or lets proponents know what number they will have on the ballot until the until we have them all verified and certified anyway. But yeah, that's that's just why I wanted to clarify because the line item mentions um, referred measures as well. So the referred the referred numbering piece that takes an ordinance, the just not repeating numbers. 
Um, that doesn't take an ordinance. That's something the clerk can do, but I, I'm, I don't want to speak for the clerk's office, but I'm not sure that those numbers would come out any sooner or later than they had in the past. Anyway, so. No, that, okay. that's absolutely correct. That's absolutely correct. Ian, did you have another question? Yeah, I just wanted to say thanks for taking the time here to discuss that. I, you know, I hear what you're saying because there's sometimes when we made the ballot and we just go straight into it. So the timing all lines up at the same time. And then because we knew the numbering, we, we could guess what we were going to be. So even if you can't tell me exactly what number I'm going to be and you could lay out what the policy is going to be so I can guess, that's at least a step towards being able to produce my stuff sooner than um, waiting from the last month to do it or two months. All right, great. I don't, I can't see everyone's screen to see if everyone has a thumbs up and I was, I don't see a way to vote in the Zoom meeting. So just. Councilman, I don't know. I don't know if, I mean, I, I would just record objections. Oh, good mm -hmm. idea. Is anyone, yeah. does anyone object to um, making this recommendation? Hey, Councilman, if everybody raised their hand, you could just count them. Uh, that's how we did the Dr. Cog meeting last night. And it would okay. show you on the panelists, it would show you uh, how many had their hand raised. Okay. Sure. So if everyone, if you're in favor of this recommendation, just raise your hand. So up in the upper right, you can see there are six people with their hands raised right now. Okay. All right. And... Ian, are you, did you raise your hand? I didn't, I didn't write down, but I think that, that we got almost everyone in favor of that. Okay, great. So that's a yes. Okay, so the next thing we did talk about at the first meeting, and I don't believe there were any objections, but I just want to confirm this for council. So can everyone then again, raise their hand if they're in favor of a single subject requirement? Okay. Is there anybody opposed to it? Okay. All right, great. And then um, training and compliance for committees and circulators. Um, count, or Clerk Lopez, do you want to describe what that is? Because um, that was your recommendation and it is my recollection that everyone was fine with it. I just want to confirm. Yeah, I mean, this is the, the same thing that we want to do is we see a lot of folks who, you know, make very easy clerical errors on their petitions. Um, you know, there are folks who are, have been nefarious in the past on petitions, literally copying things out of a phone book and we catch it, but we really can't do anything about it. And so, you know, rather than come with a stick, it's, it's, it's best that we just do the certification like if we were to do um, voter registration at the state level. Um, we do training, certification, so that there's uh, a, a, a process, and then also create a complaint process too. Um, what this does is just to say a, a code change to council ordinance. So, you know, those are things that we'd be, we'd be able to operationalize, and they would be really helpful for us. I don't know, um, Director Dawson, if, if there's anything you wanted to add to that that I missed. Um. Thank you so much, Clerk. Um, the team has been working through planning that to be able to, um, we've been working with Troy, working on drafting an ordinance of what that would look like. And so we've been working towards that and um, don't foresee any issues, um, any additional staffing with um, operationalizing that process. We have the tools ready to go. Thank you. Um, Ian, you have a question? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, my question just has to do with that. What level would the training be required? You know, there is an affidavit that people sign that they're aware of what the requirements are. And is this going to be a situation where you have some top level people who are required to take the training and then move it down? Or is it going to be a thing where you require every person? Because often, you know, you encounter people, um, you do your best to train them and they go out. And, and they collect and it's, it behooves us to have them trained well, of course, because we want them to count. And yeah. if the idea is that I have to now tell a volunteer who I'm trying to get to do a three hour shift, 
that they also have to take time for training that I could be giving to them because it's in my best interest to do. That's where I'm wondering how you're tending to structure the program, but I'm not opposed to leadership um, in a responsible position being required to do that. And I also think that needs to be coupled with um, some sort of closing out process where people are reviewed for what they've turned in so that we can improve and get better. I mean, the whole, the whole spirit of it, Ian, is, is just that. It's, it's to improve and get better, right? Um, you know, this would be top-level training. Like, if, if you were to do a, a, a voter registration drive, you have to go through a certain training with the SOS, right? And who's in charge of that voter registration drive is responsible for what comes out of that voter registration drive. So we do want to have something that's, that's like that. Um, so we do want folks to be able to, I mean, you have to train your volunteers, um, and, and Director Dawson, you, you, you step in if, if, if I'm speaking out of, out of turn. We did a whole process with this. Um, if you were to go into our elections division office, every single wall is covered with, with process maps, right? Um, any little tinker to our election law, three levels of it really can have downstream effects. So we have been very diligent in how we approach this. Um, I don't know, uh, Ben, Mr. Mr. Slayer, you... you uh, you have your hand up. You might want to chime in on this as well, too. Yeah, I was just going to say real quick that the draft that we've been contemplating um, does not have a, 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 a specific requirement um, to take the training for an individual circulator before they're allowed to circulate. I think it basically right. says what the state says, which is that this is one way for a circulator to comply with the requirement that they attest to at the end of that page that you were talking to, Ian, that they're familiar with the laws um, regarding circulation. So um, I don't think there's any anything different than what you may have experienced at the, at the state level. Ian, does that answer your question? Yeah, so then I'd be in favor. Okay. Okay. Thank Great. Thanks. So we're getting this down. Um, any objections to this? And if you are in favor of it, please raise your little hand. Okay, great, thank you. Um, the next thing is ballot title setting, which um, I've got some slides below, as well as um, addressing the referendum process, the ballot information booklet, and the clerk's recommendations from last month to address timeline issues. Um, and then at the bottom is something that um, people have uh, brought to me, several people brought to me, and we can probably discuss it at the May meeting. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next slide. <clears throat> um, Clerk Lopez, I don't have any slides on your the candidate recommendations. Do you do you want us to do a, a thumbs up? on that one too. Do you want to review them with everyone? We didn't have a lot of feedback at that meeting. And I don't know if the that was because everyone was in favor of it or not. The candidate petitions? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. There's three yeah. things you recommended. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, why don't I turn it over to Audrey? I've had a, a Miss Audrey Klein who uh, has, has analyzed this and did this on our behalf to uh, kind of analyze this, summarize it, and Audrey, take it from there. Thank you, Clerk. Um, yeah, the, the sort of quick and dirty on that one is we made some recommendations about um, uh, aligning the charter with election deadlines. Uh, currently, the last day to accept a nomination to be a municipal candidate is five days after ballot certification. Um, so we have, we have some timeline issues that we need to work with there. So the recommendation currently is to move um, that sort of regular candidate acceptance timeline um, up a little bit. I believe we, we settled on about 75 days. And then similarly, we have a problem that if someone were to withdraw as a candidate um, within 
somebody correct me here, I don't have my notes in front of me on this one. Uh, I, I believe it was 48 days, we actually would have to remove their name from the ballot. And so uh, again, this is after ballot certification, we're probably printing, and we're three days before a UOCAVA mailing deadline there. So that causes some really uh, some administrative GMs there. So if we move that timeline to sort of align with the, the other, so ballot ex or, uh, nomination acceptance would be at about 75 days. We think that an appropriate time to remove yourself from the ballot would be on ballot certification. So we have that at uh, 65 or uh, 60 days before the election. And then uh, we're working up um, because we got some very uh, some good feedback. Um, we're looking at some different options for what it would uh, what would be appropriate to uh, to set as a deadline for someone to um, become a write in candidate. So that one, we're taking that feedback that we got and we'll come back with a, a new proposal on that uh, shortly. Did I, I think I covered everything. Yep, Councilman Thank you. Thank you, uh, Audrey or Kurt Lucas. Is uh, some of this due to moving the municipal to April or is are you also adding, because I don't have the code in front of me, are we adding more time uh, or pushing it back even farther than the one month? Um, so this actually doesn't have to do with sort of the April timeline. This is more based off of um, where we certify the ballot at 60 days. It's kind of been a nagging problem for um, a couple cycles now. And um, part of part of what we're doing here is, is trying to find those nagging problems. So um, okay. I think we've just been making it work for a while, but we're at a place where uh, that seems um, like it, it really needs to change now. Thank you. Thank you. That's why I needed to know. Appreciate it. Does anybody else have any questions about these recommendations? Any objections? Uh, let me ask, because I think this came up at the last meeting. Our, does this put the municipal candidate petition deadline into the holiday week, the December, the end of December? I'm just curious if that's going to be a conflict. So if I remember correctly, and I'm sorry, I, just, I didn't uh, think I was going to be speaking to these things today. So my um, my notes are elsewhere. But um, when we were moving the, the timeline, the first opportunity to pick up your petitions uh, as a municipal candidate, I do believe that hits sort of the very end of December there. Uh, somebody might want to check my math on me. Um, but I don't think it hits Christmas. I think it's slightly after that and into the next week. But um, these are these are some of the things that we took uh, a little bit of your feedback on. And um, I think there's there's room to move there. So this is a, a valid conversation to have. I'm not sure if it's today or maybe in the next meeting, but we're, we're more than happy to talk it through. Thank you. Generally, generally, I favor that, but I would just uh, caution that if, uh, if the first, if the start of the first day of uh, picking up petitions would fall in that week, we'd have to look at the calendar for the next couple of cycles, just to make sure that it doesn't fall on a day that the city is closed for the holiday, uh, when we are sure. New Year's or Christmas. Yeah, no, Councilman, we're, we're very, very aware of that. And um, I just wanna make sure that, you know, you know, one, when we looked at our timeline, we looked at very, you know, there are sweet parts of, sweet parts of the back. Uh, to use a baseball analogy, right? In, in terms of where we wanna be able to uh, administer this and what the ideal timeline looks like um, for this particular issue, it's, it's also making sure that, you know, we are, we are not backing up far enough into um, what we still consider the election cycle all the way up to probably about December 1st, right? Now, mind you that we have a lot of processes including, including our, our risk limiting audit, including cure deadlines, including, uh, you know, canvas and by state statute, what that timeline looks like. We don't want to back up into that uh, where we have, you know, folks who are still, and we are still closing out the election from, from the previous year and then having to go in and, and do some of this other stuff at the same time, right? So I, I want to make sure, uh, Director Dawson, I, I see you on camera, which probably means that uh, you're wanting to chime in. I don't know why. No, I was just looking, I was just doing the quick math and the okay. how many days, what's the date? 75 days before the elections is 
Um, the municipal election is January 19, 2023 is when the final petitions would be due. So you'd be circulating or collecting signatures prior to that around the holidays. So. Personally, I think it's an excellent way to get your uh, your petitions at your New Year's party. I mean, I'm just saying. Thank you. I think Ian was next and then David. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I just want to make sure I understand this. So the earliest you could pick it up would be around the holidays and then you'd have to have them in by the 75th day. So you'd have like early January to collect in. Um, not the easiest way, but if the number isn't too high, I can see that. I guess um, this is just coming from being a city employee. I just want to make sure nobody That's has a nice manager that closes for a half day. So and then somebody wrong. comes down at like two o'clock and is like, I can't get my petition, you know? Interpreting those laws and making them, turning them into reality. Also, I'm well equipped at somebody the tax law. Yeah, somebody, somebody needs to mute. Understand Vicky, are you, are you on? Them. Everybody? Everybody muting? Okay. Uh, Ian, why don't you go ahead and repeat that? And Kendra, I don't know from your end if, if, if you had that kind of chatter in your ear as well. Yeah, I didn't but, hear um, Okay. Ian, why don't you go ahead and repeat that? Yeah, so so will you tell me the day again in in January, the 75 days before? It's like June 16th or is that what January you said? 19th for January 19th. January, excuse me, election. January 19th. Mm -hmm. so people come back from holidays. You got really like two weeks in there. Um, I, the, the last thing I said, I just want to make sure I understood it. And then mm -hmm. the, the second thing I said was like, I just want to make sure because I worked in the city that, you know, somebody doesn't close on a half day early around the holidays, which tends to happen. And then someone goes down there to pick it up and then they can't take it to their New Year's party or whatever else that they plan to do as the bonus. <laughs> I can confirm for the elections office, even if it's a holiday, if there's elections deadlines, we will be there. All right, David. Um, thanks, Kendra. J just to clarify and confirm, this will be a charter amendment because the 55 days is hardwired into the charter. So that'll be something for council to take up in terms of referring an amendment on particularly on this subject. But one thing I would suggest for the city officials uh, in, in the room, um, th there's, there's ambiguity historically about the nominating petition deadline as applied to vacancy elections, which for, fortunately don't come up, up a lot. But I'd recommend that if we're if we're adjusting the deadline for the problems you all have identified, go back and think about how the deadline applies to vacancy elections and jives with the, the calendar and time frame under which the city is, is required to fill those vacancies, uh, because that, that's a secondary consideration. We haven't had one in a while, but uh, but check that out if you start drafting on this. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Broadwell, you bring up something that I think we have been uh, gnawing over for a while. So I want to make sure, um, uh, Ben, if you wanted to chime in on that particular one. And, and, and Troy, I know we've had conversations around vacancy committee meetings or vacancy committee procedures for that. Yeah, I mean, the. Uh, I, I agree totally, David. Thank you. That that point is well taken. If we're going to, um, you're right. It is in the charter, um, and we have a draft for that to move it from 55 to 75 days. But uh, the point's well taken that if we start looking at that, it, it makes sense to look at the vacancy nomination process too. Anything else, David? What I can't hear you. You're, you're muted. I, I just wanted to clarify. I was talking about when somebody dies or resigns from office and you have that kind of vacancy. Uh, I, I know that you all have probably been looking at other situations where, where you, you get a vacancy in between the time you set up the election. And, and, and uh, I think uh, 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 that, that's a different issue and that's got other challenges to it. But I was talking about that, that other situation where you need to fill, a, fill the vacancy because somebody's gone away. You're, yeah, you're no. right, David. I said vacancy and nomination. And I, and you're right, I meant vacancy in office. We have been talking a lot about vacancy and nomination. So that was a slip on my part. Sorry about that. Thanks. Okay. All right, Councilwoman Sawyer. 
Thanks, Councilwoman Black. Um, there's a great question in the chat, and it was actually my question as well. And that is, um, does that mean that the the petition dates, were the date where you could pick up the petition as a candidate, um, would those back up as well? And I know that there's a. We had talked a little bit about the funky timeline because of the risk limiting audit at the end of the November election, which could potentially uh, coincide with the time or day that um, municipal candidates would be picking up their ballots or the first possible days. Um, so wanted to just flag that and see if the clerk's office had any um, uh, suggested recommendation for a plan for that or response to that, or if that's something that you're still looking into. Thanks. Uh, thank you for the question. We, we talked a little bit about this uh, in that last committee. We were, we were trying to sort of assess uh, uh, folks' preference if, if we wanted to condense that period or have that period just sort of move with the election. Um, and it seems like we have a consensus around keeping the same uh, amount of days. Um, and as far as I know, I have not heard anything from um, uh, the operations folks uh, on the election side, and Dina can speak to this. Uh, 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 we were, I, I feel confident in saying that we can run both of those processes simultaneously with, with no interruptions. Um, Audrey, can you just remind me what is the, the number of days? Um, I just, I can't remember off the top of my head and I'm wondering, and if you can't, that's okay. 35? Uh, th this, you're, everybody's hitting me with the good questions today, but I believe it's 35. Okay, so what Somebody, concerns me about that is if the deadline is January 19th, which is uh, theoretically, which is also might sometimes coincide with Martin Luther King weekend. So something to consider there. Mm -hmm. Um, but 35 days prior to that, um, you know, I just wanted to make sure that it was sometime in December that was not, you know, mm -hmm. Christmas day or whatever, which Councilman Flynn has yes. brought up. Um, but I was just trying to remember in my head what those dates were. So thanks for that. Absolutely. And I think this might be a good question for, for Troy, because I, I believe that that timeline is actually, it's only in rule. Um, it's not, I have not actually seen it in the code myself. So um, these are sort of malleable. There is, as far as I know, and I'm, I'm asking the folks with some his, history here, possibly even Mr. Broadwell, um, I don't believe that for any operations reason that 35 days means anything. So if there was a, you know, a pressing need um, and, and some good input on it, I personally do not see why that could not be expanded or moved or even just rejiggered a little bit to make sure that we're never gonna land on Christmas. We're never gonna land on, on something like that. So um, lawyers in the room, please check me to make sure I got that right. But I, I do believe that that's, um, there's no operational reason for that number. The other thing, if I might add, is when you're looking at candidate petitions, the threshold in, in terms of the signatures that you need is rather low, right? Um, and so, you know, you gotta also take that into account as well too. Um, you know, 100 for a district uh, race. Pretty low. <laughs> yeah, pretty yeah, low. that's right. And, and, and I, I see that you invented, oh, sorry, Mr. Clerk, go ahead. No, 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 no. I was just saying citywide 300, right? In a city of, you know, over half of a million registered voters. Yeah, and I think the intent here is, you know, not to shorten the period or do anything like that. It's just to move it so we can get it. Because with the 55 days, I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's after ballots have been certified since 2013 with our with our election procedures now with mail ballot elections. It, that, that date, those um, days, that 55 days kind of predates the election model that we have now. So really the intent is just to move the period to, to make it comply with the, with the type of elections we run now and not to shorten any, any um, signature gathering period. That's the reason for modernization, right? Because a lot of what we do, and for those of you who are, who are paying attention from the public, right? It's uh, you know, a lot of a lot of the the laws that we have on the municipal level are antiquated compared to the changes that we've seen in um, in the state and even in, in, in federal election laws. So we we're trying to balance all of that uh, to make it fit, and that's that's one of them. That's it's a uh, you know, 
it's something that if you know if we needed to tweak we could tweak but um it definitely i believe i mean being that i i'm, I'm also a candidate every four years um citywide that this is something that is doable right Go ahead, thank Councilman you. Sawyer. Yeah, thanks. If I can just respond to that. I think um, I, I agree with you 100%. I think the difference is that um, that functionally speaking, there are days where the city is closed, um, you know, between Christmas and New Year's. And so that that sort of, in a way, limits the, um, the number of days in that 55 days that people are actually working and can, um, you know, so, so maybe uh, if I could just make the recommendation that we extend that period to, you know, 65 days or 60 days to make up for the business days um, where potentially city offices might be closed, that it, especially if that's just a change that the clerk's office can make in rules, um, I think that that would be a fair and reasonable thing to do to ensure that there's this the same amount of ballot access as there is right now, um, recognizing that you know that's a holiday week and and so we want to make sure that we're not um, making it more difficult to uh, you know for candidates to reach the ballot, um, but that we are you know aligning the timelines properly. So just wanted to make that request if that's possible. Thanks. Point, point well taken, Councilman Sawyer. All right. Um, it sounds like people are generally in favor of all of these things with the additional suggestion from Councilwoman Sawyer. So I'm wondering if anyone has any objections and if they're with what we know now, are you generally in favor of this with more details to follow? So if you, any objections, if you're in favor, raise your little hand. Okay, great. And then um, clerk, if you and your team could, um, before the next meeting, just follow up with some more detail on that. That would be great. Can't make okay. any comments, but we definitely will follow up and we will look at that timeline, Councilman Sawyer. And I know um, uh, Mr. Tafoya, you also chimed in on something like that as well, too. We will definitely take those into account. Okay. Ian, did you have a question? No. Okay. So let's move on to um, ballot title setting. And this is a slide we've had multiple times, so I'm not I'm going to go over it again, but it's there if you need it. So the clerk has made this and this first recommendation, and um, I I wasn't clear that the the group um, was also recommending this, so that's why I wanted to just bring this back up again. And I've had multiple members reaching out to me with other ideas, which I have included on the bottom. I honestly, personally do not have an opinion. I just wanted the group to have a discussion on it. And if there is consensus, I just wanna note that for council. And if there's not consensus, I'd also like to note that with council. Um, so, uh, oh, Councilman Flynn, go ahead. Thank you, if you wanna just start discussion on this now. I okay. wasn't under the impression that we had come to uh, a consensus on this uh, last month. So I do want to explore the title board. I think it's ironic that some of our experts are not able to attend right now uh, today because uh, uh, the state title board is meeting. Yes. <laughs> That's why they're not here. Like Mark, I would love to have Mark Gruskin's input on this uh, with all of his uh, experience. But I do like the idea of the city setting up a title board that would pull on the expertise uh, and the neutrality in numbers of having the uh, city attorney's office, the Le office of legislative uh, counsel, uh, uh, you know, our attorneys, uh, the, our legislative an analyst staff, and perhaps even someone from Department of Finance, so that a title is actually accurate and neutral and understandable by voters. I was talking to a gentleman today out in the park uh, who's, who talked about uh, 
says, boy, one thing I could change is our ballots are way too long and they're hard to understand. I said, you know what? I got a meeting at 2.30 on this very topic. So I, I would definitely would like to explore this uh, further. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, David? I'll defer to the clerk and recorder. His name, his hand's up too. Okay, go ahead, clerk. But go, go ahead, uh, Mr. Broadwell. I'll, I'll chime in after I'll listen to some okay. of the comments. Um, the, just, um, I want to also extend the discussion a little bit here. And, and again, it's really unfortunate that some of those members are missing who are really expert in this particular subject. Um, but um, but uh, we'll catch them up later, I, I assume. The, um, just as a general observation, um, I believe the recommendation from the clerk is a significant improvement over the status quo. Okay, so I, I wanna say that right off the bat, but something I've been curious about as I've watched this topic proceed is it's kind of been set up as a clerk's recommendation or a title board or something like the state title board. But in the, in the original meeting, in the first couple of meetings, I've said there's a normal way that cities all over the state do this and it's neither of those things. Uh, it's a process whereby uh, uh, the, the norm in most home rule municipalities and all statutory municipalities is that title setting is done by the legislative body of the municipality. And it's not done on the front end, it's done on the back end after petitions have been submitted and, and are sufficient to go on the ballot. And the comment I made, I, I had a little by play with uh, Mark Gruskin about this at the second meeting is that this process works and has been uncontroversial in other municipalities around Colorado. So I'm unclear as to whether or not a conscious choice has been made by this group or by others in, in sidebar conversations to not consider the most conventional way that title setting is done in Colorado um, at the municipal level, at the municipal level. Um, uh, so that's kind of a question I'll leave hanging, whether or not we're even gonna talk about the pluses and minuses of what I'm calling the normal way of doing it, but but also the the kind of the, it's already reflected in the slide a little bit. But but although local title setting boards are a rarity, Councilman Flynn, um, there are simplified models out there that have diff major differences from the state title board. Right, not everything has to be done in the image of the state title board. But as a home rule municipality, you've got a lot of flexibility to decide how to do that. One prominent example is Colorado Springs. I think there's a couple of others out there, but um, my major point was what I said a moment ago, which is just understanding and making sure everybody else understands that there's fundamental different structures for doing this that are out there, time-tested, uh, and not particularly litigious or controversial uh, that don't appear to be on the, the bullets, you know, in terms of the, the potential choices that are out there for Denver. Uh, thanks, David. I did add that point at the bottom where it says note. <laughs> I said, per the statewide municipal election code, if the charter is silent, the council as the legislative body sets the title. Um, okay, next up is Clerk Lopez, and then we'll have Gina and then Councilman Flint. So I do want to um, acknowledge this. I think, you know, for some municipalities out there, it, it, it might work. I have to remind this this, this uh, um, committee that we're a city and county, right? And, and the state is clear um, with, those, with, with those designations. Now, per the statewide municipal election code, um, the, our charter is not silent on who sets the title. And, and the creation of, a, um, of the clerk and recorder and the office of the clerk and recorder is to be able to have that independence. We are a neutral party. Um, and, you know, my office is the office and is the chief elections office for the county. And it is clear in the charter uh, why. Um, in doing that, you have that independence, an independently elected official that's charged with elections, uh, administrations and operations. Title setting has never been an issue until recently. And I want to make it clear that it, there really is no it is not a, a very sexy process. It is not a process that garners a lot of attention normally. 
it has been of recent because of competing tit uh, ballot titles. This would allow us uh, to be able to do a little bit more and to expand that uh, that that power a little bit for us and and from you know with, with our recommendation would be to keep it in an independent form and an entirely in independent form. If not, we risk inserting the legislative process. We risk, risk politicizing the process. We li we we risk losing that independence. Um, I think that's something that is uh, that voters have made very clear in terms of what the expectations of my role is as the chief elections official for the county and my office's role is, is in administering those elections. Um, you know, with Colorado Springs, for example, as a municipality, they appoint magistrates. Our magistrates in our county do not do elections law. They don't do ballot, uh, ballot title setting. So that is not only a, uh, a departure from the charter, but a, part, a departure from practice. Yes, it is common in some of these other areas, but it has not been in, in Denver until an in, in, in issue in, in Denver until until a very recent. The proper order for what we see is is is, is, is what would we would like the process to be is you know that the city attorney's office representing city council provides review and comment. Um, that's the current practice under code. We would continue that along with that initial staff draft, which would be new um, when they send it over to my office. Now we draft the title, the clerk and recorder's office drafts the title using our staff draft, using the staff draft draft as a starting template. That's by the way, that's most steps, all the steps in consultation with the city attorney's office, right? That's one week. And this is what we would add to that. We have one week of written public comment on the clerk and recorder draft of title. That right there allows for that, what you know is not in code right now and that is receiving uh, public comment on it, right? And that's one of the things that our office did hear from with, with, some, of, with, with some folks that uh, were very interested in some of the competing ballot titles that were, uh, that were created. After review of any public comment, our proposal is that our office continues to finalize that ballot title and approves proponents to circulate the petition. Now, what we want to make sure is clear and what our legal analysis was, and Ben and, and, and Troy and Audrey, if you want to, to chime in at any time, feel free. I mean, there would be an appeals process of the C, of the quick and recorder title decision, and that would be available under the state or city administrative process. Now, it's quite similar to state set, title setting process, but it acknowledges generally um, uh, that in municipalities that set titles on their own with no board, and that Denver City Council lacks a, a very agency that's similar to what we see in the state's legal, uh, the legislative legal services, right? So it's not an apples to apples comparison it literally would be a radical departure from the charter and it would require something that the city just does not have. And that would be my, that's why our, you know, I, I wouldn't want to see it um, expanded um, into, you know, uh, you know, what would be a mayoral appointed administrators and council members and that's coming from a four council member. So I want to be clear. I'm not hating on the Denver City Council. That's my heart. That's where I'm from. Uh, three years as a councilman. But even if I were to continue my council hat, I would still respect that independence of, of the role that I now occupy. OK. Um, is it OK if we move on to Gina? OK, go ahead, Gina. Uh, thanks, Councilwoman Black. Uh, this is Jenna, by the way. Jenna, I'm um, sorry. It, it, it's sorry. okay. It's, it's you totally corrected fine. me before. Sorry. It's totally fine. It's hard to remember. <laughs> no, no worries, Councilwoman. It's all right. Um, well, so I have a couple of things. Um, and first of all, I really appreciate it, Clerk, for that um, that walkthrough because my very first question on this was going to be. Uh, what does the charter actually already say on this? And so, you know, if, if the charter is not silent here, then what, what does it say? And it sounds like we have a pretty clear answer on that. Because um, I, I will be honest, since our last conversation, um, when we originally talked about a couple of different ways that we could look at doing ballot title setting, 
I have been kind of going over it and over it in my head on how can we possibly go about ensuring that it's not going to be a politicized process. Because I, I will say this is probably one of the first years in many, many years that I am not actually sitting in that title board hearing personally. Um, I've been there a great many times throughout the last many years. And part of the reason that this has become such an issue is because we do see these entities just inevitably get infiltrated with some type of political perspective. And so you end up having titles that often will really not be representative of what's actually there. So I just wanted to say, I actually really, really like this recommendation. I think that this is a really good way of ensuring that not only are we following what is already in statute or not in statute, but is what already in the charter, um, but that we are also um, ensuring that we are keeping politics out of this process. The third thing on this particular um, proposal is that you also have, uh, it protects us from having to dedicate additional resources to a lot of this. And so if you, if you know, we've got, uh, you know, now we've got a title board meeting or something, we have someone who has to staff that meeting. We have to get that, you know, put up on the site. We have to, and how much additional manpower hours and, you know, money is that going to take to ensure that we have this additional process? And we already have one that fits the charter, keeps it depoliticized and doesn't cost us any, any additional resources for the city. So I am in a huge fan of this suggestion. Thank you, Jenna. Um, Councilman Flynn, you're up next. Thank you, uh, Councilwoman Black. Uh, Clerk Lopez, I actually do like uh, the recommendation, but I also feel we need to flesh out the title setting option. Uh, as uh, David Broadwell already said, either of these plus the default uh, in the statewide code would be preferable, I think, to what charter uh, eight point, uh, let me look it up here, 8.3.2 now says, because it seems to be right now an iterative, iterative process where uh, you don't actually write the title, but the petitioners committee would do that. And if you reject it as the clerk, they either can take it to court and test that, or they can rewrite it and resubmit, but they can't circulate petitions unless and until uh, they submit a ballot title, but you don't actually write it. Your recommendation would actually involve uh, drafting from the CAO and council staff and review. I do have, uh, I do take a little sl slight objection to uh, the, the discussion over neutrality. Uh, I think that having three legs of a stool or maybe even four if we involve finance, uh, but to have city attorney, clerk, uh, Council Legislative Services and uh, Department of Finance, uh, all as part of the title setting, it actually improves and enhances neutrality uh, because everybody's watching one another. Uh, ben, I see raised his hand. He might want to weigh in on this and how, yeah. how it's actually done at the state. I've not run a, a title through the state process. But conversely, uh, Clerk Lopez, let me just uh, bring up an example where having the clerk alone be the uh, decider in this process, if there were a citizen's initiative to somehow limit or change the powers of the clerk, that might put you in a very uncomfortable position having to process that. And I think that's an example where a title setting board could might provide more assurance and neutrality. Uh, when did, uh, Stephanie, you are, were you the first elected clerk or the last appointed clerk? I don't recall. <laughs> well, a little of both. I was appointed I, and then elected, yes. Okay, and that and was around the time. Yeah, and this is why I raised my hand. I mean, it was there was a call, you know, by council members and members of the Denver community to have mm -hmm. a sole election official responsible okay. for all election related matters in the city and county of Denver. And right. I just want to, I want people to be mindful of that. And when we start interjecting all these other individuals and pieces, I think that mandate becomes watered down. And then we're not giving credence to what voters really were supportive of back in 2007. So um, I'm here in Clerk Lopez relative to independence and neutrality. Um, and again, you know, with a mind towards that person being responsible for all election related matters in the city and county of Denver. So I support the recommendation from the clerk. And I hear you on, you know, what if the clerk is involved in it? I think perhaps right. there could be some some carve out relative to that consideration, but you know, a wholesale revision, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend that. Okay, because at that time of the change, we had the election commission with two citywide elected uh, election commissioners, uh, 
and the city clerk was the third uh, member of that uh, that body. And uh, when that petition came up, or was that a referral for, it was probably a referral from the council at the time. Was that 2006, 2007, David, do you yes. remember? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, that's mm -hmm. all, I think I, I, nevertheless, I think I still lean toward a board uh, structure, but I wait to hear what Ben Schler has to say. Thank you. Um, ben, do you mind if I go to Sky Stewart because we haven't heard from her yet, or did you have some? Oh, not not at all, Councilwoman. That that's completely fine. Okay, great. Sky, go ahead. Sure, thank you. Um, I, Councilman Flynn had on a number of things that I was going to raise, including uh, talking about it's actually the petitioners committee who submits the the um, suggested title and the clerk approves or rejects that. So just want to be clear about that piece of it. Um, and I totally agree with both Councilman Flynn and, and with David Broadwell that um, any of these options feel like an improvement over some of the challenges we've had. Um, one thing I, I guess I want to ask about and raise a little bit here is, is um, the idea of allowing written public comment on the title. Um, we've talked a lot about neutrality and about depoliticizing. Um, I, I worry a little bit that public comment, particularly if you've got advocates on both sides of an issue who might be weighing in um, actually adds politics to, to the process in a way that's never existed before. Um, and I'm just not sure if others on the um, panel might be able to speak to this, but I, I'm not aware of public comment being a part of title setting in other um, jurisdictions. So just interested to hear a little bit more about that. That does give me a bit of pause, um, in, particularly in terms of the idea of, of politicizing this process in a completely new way um, than, you know, than issues we have here. And I, I don't want to derail us off of this particular conversation about ballot title, um, but I do one of your, your bullets under other ideas. I don't want to lose track of because I absolutely agree um, with the idea of including explicit language in the law, preventing setting a title for something that's not legislative. Um, I believe that already exists in uh, election rules now and is um, um, something that's that's in the in state statute or in state constitution, but making that explicitly clear in our code, I think, would be really helpful. I know we've had a couple of instances where that um, issue has come into question, and so just being very clear about it, I don't want to lose track of that, even with this really great conversation about how the title gets set. So, uh, wanted to throw that in there as well. So, I wanted to make sure that uh, Ben Slayer in my office has an opportunity to to provide some of his expertise and analysis that, I, that we've asked him to look at for this. So Ben, if you wanna chime in. Sure, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna respond to Ms. Stewart's um, comment there first, only because it's fresh in my mind and I think it's a good comment. Um, I, I completely agree with, 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 with that sentiment. What I will say, because I, I, I was on the state's title board, I chaired the state's title board before, and so I've seen these things come before us. Um, and I, and I agree with um, your general reaction about um, what politicizes things and bringing, bringing that stuff into the fold. I think that that's probably uh, an argument for this, um, what I would call a hybrid between the state's title board setting and um, um, what Mr. Broadwell has talked about um, in the way that, uh, that most municipalities do it, in the, do it within the state, which is that... Um, you have written comment and written comment is fantastic because it allows folks who are educated on the issue, whether, whether they are uh, proponents or opponents of an issue, allows folks who are educated on the issue to provide you with useful feedback about what your title looks like. And I think that that is extremely useful. That's when I was on title board, that was very often um, the, the precursor to um, actually changing language within the title. You're going to get things that you don't necessarily find um, useful or, or um, you know, um, relevant to title setting, and you have to deal with that. But as like as an agency that has experts that are doing it, I think that's kind of the middle ground that that you look to, which is which is that written public comment period, as opposed to um, a board of folks trying to write a title um, in an open public meeting, which. I'm not saying that's the worst thing in the world, but I, but that might not necessarily be the best way to, uh, uh, you know, for folks in their brains to craft, you know, to craft a title. 
Um, outside of that, just a couple more comments. Um, I wanted to, first of all, let's, let's talk about what is our issue right now. Um, our issue right now is that we have a back and forth um, and I and and I'm new here, so I've only actually just had one title come in, and and I learned how we did the process, um, and it was a great process because we had a sophisticated um, group of folks who knew what they were doing. But our process still took, I think, uh, three meetings from the clerk's office plus several back and forth with um, with the proponents, even though they had written a very good title, but we had things that we decided were not uh, uh, that they had missed that we thought were. Um, um, necessary components that needed to be in the title. And so we had a pretty long process of this back and forth where all we can do as the clerk's office is say, no, we reject, right? Like that's all that we can do right now. Um, I think what we're looking to do is to, is to be able to take on that a little bit more um, and say, we have the ability to distill your title, to distill your, um, your 100, your 15, 20 page, uh, document into a, a short title, and then and then we provide that week of public comment so that anybody, whether they're proponents or opponents, have time to talk about it and uh, tell us what we've missed or tell us how we've gone in the wrong direction. And then um, and then after that, we're going to set the title, and after that, we're going to create an appeals process. And I think that. And, I, and I've talked to, to Martha Tierney, who's, who's unfortunately not here today, along with Mark, uh, talk to them about, uh, talk to Martha about that, which is that you need to have time for proponents or opponents to comment. You need to have an ability for appeal. And I think that that kind of pulls in um, everything that we're looking for. So we see it as a hybrid, but we also see it as something that um, keeps the ball uh, rolling for folks who want to um, you know, get their get their petition out there and start collecting signatures. Um, it acknowledges the fact that although council has uh, staff, it does it, it, that staff is not analogous to the state's um, nonpartisan legislative legal services. Um, you, the lawyers for the council are the lawyers for the council. They're not they're not an independent organization. Um, so it provides that that you know. Uh, separation, as you will, if if you're thinking about um, this, which is the you know the 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 first uh, enumerated right for individuals, which is the the power of initiative to to separate counsel um, from uh, the initiative process. So you have kind of a bifurcated legislative process there, and that's both at the state and at the city level, um, and so. I am not sure if I have answered answered or responded to all of the comments uh, before, but those are kind of my general thoughts on how uh, we tried to craft this. Um, can I just ask you one question, Ben? So sure. just to be clear, when you were on the state title board, you did take public comment. We absolutely did, Councilwoman Black. We we took state comment or we took comment um, during the. Uh, during the uh, the meetings, um, and that was actually, you know, ninety percent of the meeting was was taking comment, and that's why I say that comment is so um, important because very often uh, the folks that made comments uh, provided us with information that we didn't necessarily know, or provided us with expertise that we didn't necessarily necessarily have on any particular issue. Um, Although I will say personally, um, and other title board members, including Troy, who was on the title board, uh, could disagree. I, it, had it been in written comment, it would have been a more useful, um, um, it, it would have been a, a more beneficial use of time to, to sit in, and, and marinate on that comment as opposed to having to make those changes right there during a public meeting. Okay, thank you. Um, I think, uh, Ian, I think your hand was up next. Is that okay, Clerk Lopez, if he goes next? Yeah, no, absolutely, okay. absolutely. Th thank you, I appreciate that. I've never actually gone through the state title board process. I'm not really sure um, how that public comment part works. I, I tend to kind of agree with Sky that you get opponents who are trying to drive what the title looks like, who tend, especially in my instances, have the capacity and the time to pay people to be in places, which isn't always mirrored um, in the community who's going forward to bring a process forward. 
So that part gives me a pause. Now with the city council staff and attorney review, it makes me feel like we already go through that to even certify what the language is. It seems to me like that first meeting, you could have that same meeting um, to talk about what a title setting is, to get that out of the way. I mean, overall, I've gone through this more than a handful of times and it's a struggle and it always has been. And the, you kind of get the clerk's office being like, well, we might suggest this. We might, and we, I think we point blank have been like, can you just write it for us to tell us how to get this through? And it can cost you weeks and weeks can be the difference as the windows of July are now close to us. And when things are available and whether you make this year's ballot or you make next year's ballot, you know, that that's how it often has come down for us. And so, you know, I, I think I'm in, I like this first recommendation. Um, I do think that, you know, in response to your Councilman Flynn, your question, um, if it is CSA staff who are responsible for making the decision on whether these things move forward, like they have been in every instance I've worked with them, then I'm not so concerned about what the clerk's feelings are in a rare example that the clerk's powers would be eroded or changed. So I guess all that to be said, like, I, I, I guess I would also really like to know, like, if there's like a, a time limit of an estimate on how long this could take. And if it's shorter, I think the longest we ever took us was almost a month. And the shortest was maybe like 10 days. Um, and it really has to do with how complex your issue is that you're bringing forward in the first place, um, or how long it is. So, you know, I would really like to, to know that part. Um, but I'm inclined to think that I like the recommendation from the clerk's office um as i see it minus the public comment as i was saying i i i, I it just doesn't i don't know if i i'm not i'm not concerned about that because it feels disempowering to the people who brought it forward okay thanks ian uh david broadwell i, I have a follow-up question maybe for troy but maybe also for ben um if if the city goes forward with the charter amendment to change the title setting. Um, do you agree that for initiated charter amendments, you're bound to follow state law? In other words, or, or are you thinking otherwise that you'd be able to have the church, the, the clerk in charge of title setting, both for ordinances and, and title writing, I should say, uh, in, in both for ordinances and charter amendments? because I, I read state law on initiated charter amendments as being locked down by state law and state law says the, the governing body ultimately uh, writes and approves the title for charter initiated charter amendments. Any comments or thoughts on that? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm in line with you there. Uh, state law does dictate uh, initiated charter amendments that title is set. Uh, by council. So we would only be talking about citizen initiated ordinances. Okay, th thanks, Troy. I, I mentioned earlier at the first meeting that they've been rare, but somebody might at some point bring an initiated charter amendment again and get that all cranked up as well. So thanks for that clarification. All right, Clerk Lopez. Yeah, no, and I, I appreciate all the dialogue here. Here's the thing for, for me, it's, 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 let me clarify the independence part. As the chief elections official for the county, I have no dog in the fight. And let's, let's take something that was very, very recent. And that was uh, the two competing ballot titles in, that had to do with the Park Hill open space. Various council members took positions and you know where they were at on it. Um, they were, adamant either for or against, I don't take a position. As the chief elections official, I don't even take a position on a referendum that I asked uh, council to consider. And that was 2H in 2020, which would have increased the number of appointees in my office to level it out. You didn't hear me speak in favor or against it. That's the level of independence and that's a level of expectation of neutrality from an elections official and that's what makes that's what makes it truly independent and that's why our system is trusted that's why our elections model is trusted this is not the first conversation we have on it we are out here defending that independence as elections officials at the state capitol and at the u.s capitol so 
I have to really stress as much as I, I understand the three-legged stool and I get that Councilman Flynn, I, you know, I, I really appreciate you kind of bringing that thought process out there. I do think that that, needs to, that is a value that Denver voters have. That's a, the value that they made clear in the creation of my office and the creation of our role and our role to exclusively uh, administer elections. It is that neutrality from an elected official by the people, not somebody that's appointed. And I think that's, um, that's one thing that needs to be clear. Um, the second thing is, is that right of Colorado residents to be able to use the initiative process outside of the legislative process, right? That also needs to be, those are two distinct lanes and, and access to, 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 to representation, right? I don't opine on that. My office doesn't opine on that. We are very neutral. It was never an issue until this, these last two competing ballot titles. And that's one of the reasons why we are, we're suggesting public process because we got right through the coals because we told folks straight up, transparent and all transparency that we're all about, um, there is no public process. We don't have a public process by law. Now, that's something that we can consider, but I would, I'm adamantly opposed to inserting a legislative branch in the mayor's office into the ballot title setting process. With all due respect, I love you guys, but all you right. gotta think about these positions and roles without names. Okay, uh, Councilwoman Sawyer. Thanks, Councilwoman Black, um, and thanks, Clerk, for uh, for sharing that that information. I appreciate it. Um, at the very beginning of this conversation, David Broadwell had said uh, had mentioned Colorado Springs, and David, I think you talked about it before um, in a previous meeting, and I cannot remember exactly what you said. Would you please do me a favor and refresh my memory? How does the city of Colorado Springs do this? Um, just curious because they're another strong mayor, city and county form of government. Um, so I look to them a lot when I'm uh, looking at, you know, potential ideas and would just love to have an explanation of that if you don't mind. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, uh, thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, just very briefly, they have, they have a relatively short ordinance that describes their process. Uh, and it's kind of like a light version of the state process. And let me just say one huge difference if any city ever tries to do it is one of the reasons I believe the state process is so litigious is because you have a direct line of appeal to the Colorado Supreme Court. And you read, you read headlines about this all the time, right? A municipality can't do that. You have no authority to do that. So their process, they have, a, they have hearings, they have a three person uh, title board with appeals to district court is about as much as you can do. Uh, and theirs has been on the books for uh, 15, 15 years, I think. Uh, and, they, and they set it up years ago because they have a very active uh, uh, petition, petitioners down there in the Springs, traditionally, one, one guy in particular. But, um, but in, in their three-legged stool, they chose to use clerk, city attorney, and presiding judge of the municipal court. Uh, the clerk referred to this earlier. That third leg, presiding judge of the municipal court, is probably not what Denver would do. Uh, uh, you know, if you were to set up a title setting board, I think it's important to clarify who each of the three legs are. And that's probably not something that Denver would choose to do. Uh, you might choose like president of city council being the third leg. So it'd be the clerk, the city attorney, and the president of city council. Two officers clearly defined in terms of who might be uh, appropriate members on the title setting board representing three different perspectives. Um, but certainly continuing to include the clerk. So, but but um, I know that that's 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 not a feature of the Colorado Springs ordinance that you would necessarily want to emulate. But uh, uh, that's it's just it's it it is they receive the text uh, of the proposed measure and then write a title. Collectively, the three of them do uh, similar to the way the state process works. Okay, thanks. So I guess um, what I'm taking away from that then is that uh, there is a clear separation of powers uh, or, or collaboration of multiple branches of government. Um, what those 
three branches are might uh, differ, but the the purpose of the ordinance and, and correct me if I'm wrong here because I'm I'm just sort of making sure I'm working through this in my head. So the the purpose of the ordinance is really to ensure that there is buy-in from um, all of the different branches of government uh, that are um, that exist that voters are are, are voting on and are um, so that they're a part of the process. I, I, uh, just one follow-up comment. I, I think the purpose is exactly what we've been talking about here, to depoliticize it right. by dispersing the power among three people who will balance each other. Somebody talked about that earlier. But in reasonable minds can disagree about what is more politicized or less politicized. But I think uh, that's a point that uh, Councilman Flynn was making earlier as well. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Um, just for clarification, because I do not know the answer to this, do they have an elected clerk down there? Uh, uh, no, because they're, they're a pure municipality. They're not a city and county. Got it. Uh, okay, great. And, and so they, they don't. Uh, elected clerks in pure municipalities are relatively uncommon in Colorado. Wheat Ridge happens to have one next door, uh, but, uh, but most, most municipal clerks in Colorado are appointed. The, okay. Each county has a clerk and, you know, okay. we're city and county. So we're, when we're looking at El Paso County and Denver County, those are apples to apples. Denver, city and county of Denver and the city of Colorado Springs are not apples to apples comparison. Got it. Because okay. they're not a county. Yep. Got it. Thank you. Really yeah. appreciate that clarification. Thanks so much. Thank you. I think uh, comparing Denver to Colorado Springs is apples to bananas sometimes, <laughs> if you get right down to it, right? You, uh, I, I was thinking it, Councilman, but you said it. Let the record show that. Happy to do that. Happy to channel uh, me vicino. <laughs> uh, I would suggest, uh, uh, Councilwoman Black and Clerk, that uh, given the time and the agenda, that maybe let's have a show of hands here. Uh, I still am withholding uh, you know, my vote of consensus on the recommendation, although I don't see, I don't find it to be uh, uh, faulty. I just continue to think that the title setting board may be preferable. But uh, if we could at least get a sense of the group that uh, we can report then to the policy committee at council, and, and then we can move on, uh, would that be acceptable? Yeah, I was going to suggest that, first of all, I think we all are in agreement that we want to improve the ballot title setting process. So if you if you disagree with that, then yell right now. But I think we all do agree we want to see a change. Um, so I think we will for sure let the council know that. And then we can poll people now, but I do want to make sure that um, our missing members also have a chance to weigh in. Um, but we can poll people here today and then if they wanna weigh in later, then we can add that. But go ahead, Kirk Lopez. No, I do appreciate that. And I, I, you know, this is the sausage making and policy, right? But I do have to say as the, as the elected clerk and recorder, I have to stay true to what voters intended in our office and to, you know, there's a reason why we are the gold standard in the nation, right? There's a reason why in Denver, folks, you can't, you can't sell a, well, the, you know, a, um, a bought off uh, elections process or a botched elections process or a skewed elections process, like what you hear all over the country with some of these folks. We recently had a visitor saying stuff like that, right? So our, our, our model is trusted, it's tried, it's true. And it's because of the, a, a great deal because of the independence of the clerks in this and for the counties in this state. Um, this, you know, would be a radical departure um, in terms of operations of, uh, of elections administration, especially with, with, with title setting. You know, the title setting board technically is you know, our, the city attorney's office, our city attorney that's assigned to us, you know, um, after review and comment of which council is a part of, council's attorney and council members are welcome to sit in the review and comment portion as they come. Um, but when it comes to setting that title, it's my staff with, um, with our city attorney's office, uh, uh, Troy, you know, so I think, you know, this is something that we really have to take into account. I. Um, I wouldn't support anything but uh, the, the recommendation from our office because of that. 
Okay. Um, Stephanie? I just had a question of clarification. Are you polling on the recommendation from the clerk? I'm going, I'm, I'm about to do that. So did you have any? That's what I just wanted to know for sure. That's yeah. what you were pulling on. So if you, I'm assuming everyone agrees that we need to improve the ballot title process. And so now if you are supportive of the clerk's recommendation, raise, raise your hand. I've got Ian, Stephanie, um, Clerk Lopez, Gina, uh, I see Bianca, and okay. And then if you support, a, a, if you aren't necessarily supportive of this, I guess I wanna ask those of you who didn't raise your hand, do you support a particular recommendation or are you just open generally? Can you just explain a little bit before I ask you what you should be voting on? Go ahead, Councilwoman Sawyer. Thanks, Councilwoman Black. Um, I am not, I am, I understand, um, you know, the clerk's point and what the charter says clearly. Um, but part of what we're talking about here is the potential of referring charter change amendments to the voters to vote on. So um, I'm just, I feel like I need a little more information about all of the different potential options that might exist here. Obviously, um, I agree that that something needs to change to improve it. I'm not sure what um, is the right answer. And I feel like we haven't kind of had enough opportunity to really talk through, um, you know, what like cities do, what uh, other, you know, what, what, uh, pub, the public might be interested in what, um, you know, et cetera, all of the different things that we look at as a legislative branch, when we're talking about referring charter change amendments, I feel really strongly that, um, we don't change the charter unless it's for something very, very important. So I, I really, I feel like I need more information before, um, before I could make a choice on exactly how to move forward with this. Um, so that's why I didn't raise my hand. Okay, sounds good. Um, Clerk Lopez, did, did you have something to say about that? Your hand is Well, I, you know, Councilwoman, I do absolutely respect what your, your opinions are and that's why we're having this process. And it's not the first time that we've talked about this. Um, you know, it, it's, it, yes, it requires a charter change um, to even improve the process in my house. And, um, you know, I wanna make clear there are, there are two things here. One is to remain um, true to what the intent of my office exists for, and that's to have neutral elections administration through its independently elected official, um, as opposed to having uh, the change which would be required by Councilman Black's proposal, which would actually insert the legislative, pro the legislative <clears throat> branch and um, the mayor's office by yeah, virtue Clerk of the Lopez, appointees into that. Clerk Lopez, I like totally understand that. I disagree with you. That's all. And we can, I, no, we can that, disagree and be reasonable that, about it and, and have can, more conversation. We can um, absolutely disagree, but it frankly, quite frankly, looks like a power grab. And, you know, on, and, I'll, and I will say this um, on any call and I will say this in any public setting. That's what we're defending against nationwide. We have folks that are not happy with the outcome of elections. And I get it. I get that folks are not happy with the outcome of some elections. But in this state and in this county, we have a system that is transparent, it is accountable, it is audited, it is tested, and it's a very independent um, uh, form of, of administering elections. And we're not the only one that does it this way. So I think- Yep, I understand that. Know, um, I don't appreciate it, it, the, the fact that you just removes, accused me of a power the, grab. I think that's unprofessional. And I think it, that that's not, that's not appropriate because we can agree to disagree and disagree without being disagreeable and calling people names and accusing them of things. So I've got to say, I think that that was highly unprofessional and highly inappropriate. Um, but names. I also, hold on. I also want to say, um, I understand your point. I disagree with it. I'd like more information. And that's why I didn't raise my hand. That's fair. And that's not something that's a power grab. And it's not something um, that is making a decision without all of the information in front of me. And so I don't appreciate that. Thanks. So um, thank you for bringing that up. Names. Thank you for bringing that up, Councilman Sawyer. Council. She, she wasn't 
saying she preferred a different option. She just said she wanted more information. And to be very clear to everyone, and I said this in an email, none of these things are my recommendations. So um, Clerk Lopez, please um, don't say that. These are not my recommendations. These are ideas that people have suggested to me that I just wanted the group to discuss. So we had a discussion. So I, I don't actually have a preference. Um, I, I agree with those people who say all of these options are better than what we have now. So anyway, if I can go back to kind of polling people, um, David, did you want to let us know your thoughts on this? My overall thought is what I started with a while ago, do something. Uh, uh -huh. And I've tried to be constructive here today by sussing out what some of the multiple other options might be um, with a concern that not, as Councilwoman Sawyer just said, not all the possibilities in, in my view have been fully talked through yet. And I'm glad, I think we made some progress here today on that. So, uh, so I don't have strong feelings about either a title board or the procedure used under state law by so many other municipalities. I'm just hopeful that some consensus can be reached to change the current system to a system where city officials will have better control over the clarity, the objectivity, and so on and so forth of the ballot title uh, in the public interest. So, so I'm, 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 uh, you can't nail me down in terms of what it might be. That's the general principle I'm here to advocate. Okay, great. And um, let's see, who else haven't we heard from? Sky? Sure. Uh, similar to Councilwoman Sawyer, I, I think there's several options here that are worth talking about and would like to hear more. And to be honest with you, I have a tremendous amount of respect for um, a couple of the members who aren't here today that know a lot about the title board process. Um, and I would love to hear from them before I, I feel comfortable making a recommendation myself. I, you know, I think this group has um, a lot of great expertise here, and we've heard a lot of great comments today, but we are missing three members who are, are very knowledgeable about this very subject. And so um, part of my hesitation is wanting to flesh out that discussion a little more with their commentary as well. Okay, so how about if after this meeting, we'll follow up with them. They all said that they would watch the meeting um, and we'll see what comments, feedback they have, and then um, we can discuss it at the next meeting, I guess. But I will note that we had, if I include, include Clerk Lopez, we have five solid yes votes for the clerk's recommendation. So, um, and then we have th three people. Oh, uh, Councilman Flynn, we didn't hear from you. Did you have a preference or did you want just more information? No, I want more information. I want to learn more about it. And uh, not to reignite the, the, the power grab, but I do, which I do understand uh, uh, why that was said. I see a title setting board, uh, Clerk Lopez, as a power dispersal to diffuse it in order to make it, in my view, more neutral. I'm very, now you and I have a lunch set up for next week. Uh, yeah, let's chat about it. I see nothing wrong with your proposal, I just would like to see if the title setting board notion uh, can work and inspire more confidence. That's all. Thanks. Go ahead. I, yeah, no, I appreciate that. And, you know, having served on the council for four terms, for three terms, I understand that. Uh, but as a council member, I also took positions and I also passed proclamations in support of uh, ballot recommendations and support, you know, of various uh, things that were on the ballot. You don't see me doing that. Um, that's for a reason. Um, and that's to ensure voter confidence. And that was the main reason why this office was created because it is independent from an independently elected official. Now, if you had um, folks who were on that title setting board, would they still remain neutral? And would the public have confidence in that title setting board if the council members that were appointed or the, the administration, the mayor's administration at the time 
took a position in one way or the other on that on that uh, on that uh, citizen initiated ordinance, um, would there be confidence, right? And could we assure that that there was that there was neutrality in that? And so I think you know when you think of three legged stool, you have you know um, two of those stools, two of those legs that are not bound uh, to not be neutral. Um, whereas, you know, uh, it is common practice for us as elections officials to be able to do so to ensure that fair process. And that's what I'm talking about. And that's why my office exists. And that's why my role exists and the charter is very clear on matters of, of, of elections administration and why it is exclusively reserved in the clerk and recorder's office. Okay, so um, let's follow up with those other people and um, and get some more information. Are, for those of you who want more information, do you want more information on a title board? Is that the other option you'd like more information on? Okay. Councilman Black, um, I would love some more information on um, if there are similarly situated city and counties across um, either Colorado or like cities um, in other states, I'd like to, I'd just like to know how other, how other cities do it. Um, you know, we've talked through the state uh, and we've talked about why that isn't the right solution, but I'd like to know more about how other cities make this work for them. Um, and, you know, it's, possible that uh, that the recommendation that's been put forth by the clerk's office is the right answer, but I feel like I just don't have enough information yet. So I'd love to know some some uh, like for like comparison. Thanks. Okay. Um, all right. Well, we clearly aren't getting through our agenda today, but um, I think we needed to have that discussion. So thank you, everyone. The next thing was um, citizen referendum and um, I, we don't need to go over what the problem was because I think we're all familiar. Um, and I know, um, Troy, you recommended number two, but um, Kevin Flynn was very much wanted to do uh, the first one. And I know there are other council members who also were interested in that. And so, Kevin, I'll let you say a few words about that. Thank you, Councilman. Just uh, briefly. Uh, there was tremendous confusion over 2F, and it does not occur very often. In fact, uh, David, uh, I couldn't remember any uh, referral uh, in, in my, I've been here 40 years. I don't remember. David, you've been here almost that long. Uh, but when it did happen, the universal reaction I got from people was just very confusing. So I vote yes if I don't like it and no if I do. And, and that's what it was. So I think that the option of saying uh, repeal or retain retain this ordinance, repeal this ordinance, makes it very clear. Uh, but I, I understand uh, maybe Troy or someone else, uh, Clerk Lopez in your office was saying that there's some uh, impediment to that uh, in the yes. Secretary of State. Yeah, Councilman, there is. And, um, and is, there a way, is there a way that we can remove that impediment at our, at our level? So that's why I'd like to hear from Anshul is in our meeting. Uh, John Griffin is here. Troy is here. Maybe we could we don't have to settle that right here and now, but uh, I do think that's the most logical thing. That's what the people want. They want clarity on what they're voting for. So, Mr. Bratton, um, Mr. Slayer, you want to um, chime in on that? Sure. So, I guess the major impediment, I mean, we, our code provision says that we follow state law with the yes or no. So, yes, we could change that. But I guess my main concern would be voter confusion with that because we've done the same thing for for so long and for all of our questions. So I, you know, it's it's a policy matter to be debated um, and maybe studied. But I guess my concern is that we would maybe create confusion by change by moving away from a yes or no. But um, that the analysis that I actually did is that it would. Re it would require a change to the charter and to our code because um, our code says that we follow state law and state state law requires the yes or no question on it. Um, also, okay. our charter 
our charter requires that the proponents of a referred measure draft the draft the title just like with a refer or just like with an initiated measure. So that would require the the change um, to the charter as well. Okay, I uh, I don't think the average voter knows that the state rule says it has to say yes or no. The state rule makes it confusing, and I think our our duty here is to make it less confusing for the voters. The voters had a tremendous confusion. I don't. It obviously would not have changed the outcome, uh, but uh, well, actually, I can't say that. I don't know if it would have. Uh, but uh, when you have to vote yes if you're opposed and no if you're in favor. That's, that's that's always confusing. So if we can change it, I would advocate, let's do that. Uh, I don't think the voters will be very confused by, should I repeal this ordinance or should I repeal it? Thanks. All right, does, does, oh, Ian, go ahead. I just wanna agree with Councilman Flynn. I think that the language he's picking is really straightforward and and, and I think it could make a big difference because I would agree that people were very, very confused on that one. I think that was the one I've heard the most confusion on in years. So do, does anyone have any other comments? And um, if not, do we want to do a quick, oh, go ahead, Clerk Lopez. Yeah, no, as I would really, really defer to, um, you know, making sure there's consistency with state law and you know, this would be one of those exceptions. And it's an exception of very, very, very rare instance to the point where we, um, in, in my office, how to make that call as a citizen referendum, right? This is the first time that I've ever seen anything like that in 15 years of being an elected official in the city. Well, and I, I should add again, it's, it's a policy matter, but the way our our charter requires the question to be written is that it says um shall the voters of the city and it must start with shall the voters of the city of and county of denver repeal and then the answer is yes or no so i think that you know we could get creative with how you start that question or how the question is is asked um and and still use the yes or no i guess my you know i I've been doing elections a long time and before making a change like that, I think it might be worth some kind of study or, or something to make sure you, you're not creating more confusion or you, you, just to make sure you're actually lessening the confusion um, when there's been such a, such a long standing procedure like that. Uh, can I say, uh, Councilman Black, I, I yeah. agree with that. I don't think this is an urgent matter. I don't think this is something that we need to move on to council and resolve because I don't think we'll see this again uh, for quite some time. I could be wrong, but this is the first time we've seen it in, in, in decades. So I don't think this is an urgent matter that needs to be resolved right now. Uh, but I think Troy has identified a few ways to do it. Uh, I still would say retain or repeal is the best, is the best path. All right, Stephanie. Yeah, I was just gonna uh, comment on the confusion part of the conversation because um, I think we need to be attentive to the fact that if Denver's inquiries look different than the state's inquiries, that could cause further confusion for the voting public. So they might be thinking in Denver's instance, repeal or retain, and then you get out to the state and it's yes or no, I mean, it's just, it's a cornucopia of confusion or could be. So I just want to point that out as we continue to have the discussion. Although the this, yeah. states is already different from ours, right? Well, it doesn't it go further complicated through this. No. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the state uses yes or no. And that's, I yes mean, or no. I, I think, um, I almost called you Clerk O'Malley. <laughs> Clerk O'Malley is right that, um, that's why that's why that uniformity exists, and that's why we you know we have that in the code to follow the state law. So when you have you know state questions, and then you move down to municipal questions, or you have school districts, or occasionally there's a question that involves more than one jurisdiction. Um, like I know Sky and David will remember the the some airport um, questions that were on the ballot. You got to be able to marry those up with other jurisdictions too. So you don't want to. So the uniformity is important there. Uh, 
Um, Ian, go ahead. Well, I just want to respond to Councilman Flynn. I think if we're able to take care of these kinds of things in this committee while it's conven convened, I think that's a critically important part to not to repeat that. And I might say, Councilman, I didn't really know about this, but now that I do know about it, who knows if people like me might chose to exercise it more. I, I got a few I could suggest. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Sky, I saw that you had your hand up. Well, I, I mean, I don't want to <laughs> belabor some of these points, but I, I mean, I think the point you maybe were trying to make, Councilwoman, that, that is important about what is different about our process than the states already is that our ordinance has already taken effect when voters are voting on it. We don't have that holding period that every other city and the state has before something goes into effect when people are considering a repeal or retain. So it's, it's a totally different set of circumstances um, which I think is is why this is worthy of more discussion. I you know I don't disagree that maybe this is one that we need to take more time and look at. But um, I, I understand the idea of consistency with the state in terms of drafting the ballot questions, but the, the operational consistency is not there. You're asking a, a very different question to the Denver voters when something has already taken effect when they vote, but when they're voting on it versus the state is asking, should this take effect or not? It just feels different to me and feels worthy of having a different conversation. Mm -hmm. um, I personally agree with you on that. And I think changing to repeal and retain would be much clearer for voters. But um, so I don't know, do we have anyone signed up for public comment or should we just keep plugging away at the agenda? We are at time and we should, we're almost at time and we should probably, I mean, what, what's left councilman? Well, we're looking at actually quite a lot, but has anyone signed up for public comment? And up for public comment. Okay. Um, Ballot information booklet. Well, I, I just want to wrap up the citizen referendum question. I think that there probably is consensus that we need to do something. Um, does anyone oppose, is anyone opposed to that? Councilman Flynn? Yeah, I would say, you know, given Ian's comments, uh, I think he's right. Uh, I, would, I would favor moving this along to uh, the council with a recommendation that we uh, recommend using the retainer or, or a repeal option on on citizen initiated uh, referrals. Clerk Lopez. I want so when we when we met we talked about our our staff attorneys being able to meet and confer and to really look at and to do a deep dive in that analysis. I'm not comfortable with moving that forward because of the inconsistency that it would create. Um, unless there is a clear way forward from our, I mean, from, from our end as well, because I think it's, you know, part, part of what we don't want to do is confuse voters. And we've been doing everything possible to try to align county uh, to be able to work together with very like and similar methodologies and you know for something that is so rare i don't think it requires that much of a, of a change where you have to where we have to go in and change it i think is the, the risk is confusing voters more than it is anything and i don't know if anybody else wants to, i don't want to belabor the point but I mean, from our analysis, it, it's, it leads to voter confusion. Okay, well, I know that this is a priority for some council members. So if this group doesn't have consensus, then we won't make that recommendation. But can I at least say that this group agrees that this is something that needs to be addressed without specifying the details? Is everyone okay with that? Yes. Okay. Um, and then 
the, the other items, you know, we don't have a lot of time to, to delve into. Um, as long as we don't have anyone signed up for public comment, someone has isn't muted and there's a ton of background noise. I don't know what that is. Um, Ian, did you have something to add? I see in the in the question, someone was asking if they could make a public comment and seeing as no one signed up, but if they were present, I thought perhaps we might offer that to them. Um, well, we have a process like we do with council and people need to sign up in advance for public comment. Um, so that's the way um, council members wanted to um, conduct this meeting similar to the way we, we do public comment at our council meetings. Um, and people can also email to the BAM email address. Um, if, if we have time, I'd like to just get one more um, topic that might be easier, the, um, or a, a sliver of it. So the ballot information booklet there's a lot we can talk about, but the clerk did make these recommendations here. Um, and I just wanted to know if there was consensus at, for at least these recommendations and we can talk about other recommendations maybe at our next meeting. Um, so the first one was to um, close the comment period earlier, 60 days versus 50 days to give them more time to create the booklet. And then the other recommendation was um, to allow the clerk to summarize the pro comments. Right now they can only summarize the opposition comments. Does anybody have anything to say about those? Do you like those ideas? Yes, yes I do. Clark Lopez, do you, have, else? do you have anything to offer on the, the background for this, the reasoning for it? It seems obvious I mean, to me. Yeah, and, and part of it is just trying to wrangle. Um, we are the only county that has that, uh, this kind of booklet. And I think it's really important for us, if we're going to have a booklet that we, uh, to the best of our ability, um, can, try to, can try to summarize and to try to, you know, solicit favor from, or not, well, and put in favor and against. Um, right now, we could only summarize opposition comments. Um, however, there's a lot of other heavy lifting in terms of fact checking and stuff like that. So, you know, it, these are going to be baby steps. And there's a lot that, you know, we just don't have as a city an apples to apples comparison of what would be a comparison, like to the, for example, to the, to the state entity that does this uh, is just it, it's a it's a well-oiled machine in terms of how they create that state booklet and it happens over over a period of almost a year so i think you know for something like this what we want to avoid with this booklet is it being characterized as facebook on paper and basically it's you know it's it just comes right in and we can't edit it except for um, length and uh, vulgarities. So yeah, no, our recommendations are uh, are what we're recommending. I do have um, one question. Currently, for council referred council writes the pro statement. Is your recommendation to still allow council to do that? Or would that be part I mean, of what you would summarize? It's, that's that's a council process, and that is as as the um, proponent. Mm -hmm. um, if it's too long, mm -hmm. you know, I think it gives us the ability to be able to look at that. And I think, you know, if we're asking for that measure from the public, um, and for it to be factual, for it to be um, uh, true, um, I think you know, it would probably be expected of the council to be able to uphold that same standard as well, too. So, you know, for us to be able to chime in on that gives it gives it that uh, that equity. So, yes. 
So your recommendation includes summarizing what council submits for a pro comment. It would be it would be helpful for us ahead of time for council to be able to be able to, I mean, summarize it and make sure it's factual and sent to us, which is a you know also speaks to the timelines that you guys have as well too, and which to operate. Which I know that's something that you, uh, as a count you, uh, councilman and your colleagues on the council are looking at changing anyway. So I think as long as there's enough time uh, coming to us to be able to do that, then yes. And just to clarify, your recommendation was to summarize, but I just heard you say verify. So are you adding verify? If we are, I'm saying verify? it has to be. So what I'm, no, not verification, but oh. whatever, um, I'm saying what, whatever requirements we are asking of the public through the council initiative, through the initiated ordinance mm -hmm. in terms of content, we should my advice would be is to to replicate that on and have the same kind of standards from council members as they refer so that there doesn't seem to be some kind of impropriety in the process i mean that's what my recommendation would be um all right does anyone have any feedback on that comments questions hey kendra i had my hand up Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see it. It's... I, I, and just very quickly, I apologize if this was on a subsequent slide, but one of the yeah. most cogent things I've heard the clerk's office talk about is the importance of council, council self-imposing an earlier deadline for questions you're referring to the ballot. It's not on this slide, but th th this is really important. And what, what I've come to learn listening to all the concerns and the experience from last year that's inevitable. If you want a ballot information booklet process that works, council has to self-impose an earlier deadline than we've always advised about in the past. Uh, and so that, again, can be done by ordinance. I agree with that part of it. But, but, but I think that's a very important thing for council uh, to talk about as this goes forward as being a component of all this. Maybe one of the most important things for all future councils to understand you got to start earlier. Um, at the state legislature, they know when they adjourn in May what they've decided to put to the ballot in November. Uh, you don't need to go that early, but it's, it's going to be a significant change from what's always been the case in Denver uh, to, to be able to make these other deadlines work. Can I ask a, a question, uh, Councilwoman? Uh -huh. uh, just this, on this recommendation, uh, Clerk Lopez, allow the clerk to collect and summarize. When you summarize, uh, opposition statements, for example, how, how, what's the process for ensuring that it is uh, contextually accurate and not uh, uh, to the disadvantage of the proponents or the opponents? And how, how do we do that? I know you do it now if it's over 500 words, but uh, because you have to get it into 500. But if you were yeah. to summarize statements, that, that could be fraught with, uh, well, with, with politics, frankly. How, well, how would that be? I've had Ben uh, take a look at this and really do an analysis. You know, in 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 previous in 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 previous iterations, it was you know Excuse Dan both cautioned myself to be. Able to... Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry. Um, let me have Ben chime in on that. Ben, you're mute. Yeah. Kevin, I think you're on mute. Oh, Councilman, I'm sorry. I was going to say I don't see Ben. Is he here? Yeah. So what we what we normally do is we we are able to you know look at length and and be able to edit per length and you know certain content. It's it's very rare. Um, you know, there's just, there's just certain things in there that we would watch out for. And that is, you know, vulgarity and that's, um, you know, a dissertation, right? And so, you know, it would probably, you know, I think from my end, uh, moving forward, I think, um, uh, yeah, um, Ben got exited from the meeting, he's trying to reconnect. Um, but, um, you know, from our end, it, it, it's been very rare that there's been any contention with it. 
Um, I don't know where politics would take a play into it, um, being that we have no dog in the fight in any of these um, proposals. Um, like I said, I mentioned on an earlier example, even with a known proposal that we had that we uh, tried to refer through council on 2H in uh, 2020, we didn't opine in on. Um, so I think, you know, for us, it's just, it's a neutral party being able to independently look at um, the content, summarize it to the best of our ability. Without, you know, without, uh, you know, uh, well, let me just say this, taking in mind the intent um, of the, uh, the initiative or the question. Right. I, uh, yeah, I appreciate that. It's, uh, it's still fraught with yeah. uh, potential for uh, not accurately representing what the opposition might have meant or the proponents might have meant on a citizen initiative. And Ian, I don't know if you'd like to ask you to chime in on this because I don't know how you would feel about the clerk's office. It might not always be Clerk Lopez. It could be Clerk Tina Peters, right? Just to pull a name uh, randomly out of the air, uh, who is summarizing your <coughs> uh, uh, submitted statement of support. And I don't know that that would, that would be a pretty uncomfortable position, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Chair, is it okay if I respond? Yes, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilman Flynn. Um, I've never felt like I was dealing with the clerk whenever I was actually doing the work, the elected position. It's been staff members that I've built relationships yeah. with over the years that are CSA staff. And I actually have worked with other clerks before Paul Lopez um, in putting my first ballot initiatives on. In fact, no, I don't think I ever did one under um, Clerk O'Malley, but certainly after with that. So I, I guess I don't have as much fear about that. I personally, I like the idea of writing my own pro, my own pro statement. It's what I do in elections. Um, that's what we're trying to do and sell to people on a regular basis. Um, so the, the being the clerk in particular, who is, who is uh, Tina Peters, I, I, not really an issue for me. I like being in control of that. I prefer writing my own pro statement and getting assistance with the title board to move faster if I had a choice. I mean, this would be summarizing that necessarily. I mean, you'd still have the ability to create your pro and submit your pro statement. Um, this would be if it was over 500 words. It's um, only if I go over 500 words? Right. Oh, yeah, we could get yeah, it under. Summarize. I, yeah, okay. Yeah, the only wrench yeah. I would throw into that is that, uh, and da uh, David, you might recall this. Uh, I think it was a state issue where a an opposition uh, party person actually submitted a pro statement that was written uh, so as to elicit the opposite reaction of support. I'm not remembering what the initiative was, but it was clearly a manipulation. And under our current rules, uh, I think you would have to then summarize that and include it as a pro statement because uh, you wouldn't have the option of rejecting it. It looks like your recommendation is that you would acquire that authority or you would acquire that power to do that. David, so, if, you're, if you recall that, I'd love to re, I'd love to have my memory refreshed on which one that was. David actually left. Okay. We've, we've now gone over Ben, our time. ben is Ben is actually in the room. Oh, he was ben. disconnected, but so Ben, part of the part of the I don't think he heard the full question, uh, Councilman. So if you want to maybe repeat your your question, Ben, I think you know to summarize the the, the Councilman's comments. Uh, you know is if and when we have to summarize uh, input in favor or against initiatives to the public, what does that process look like? And what's the, what are the guardrails for politics? Should there be any in that process? Yeah, the, and I apologize everyone for dropping off. My, my internet kicked out on me there for a second, I think, but- um, And this isn't a blue book, right? Our blue book. Right. Um, I, I think the answer to that is that you're, you're well, first of all, you're looking at nonpartisan staff from the clerk's office that are that are not involved in politics like myself. Um, but um, it's kind of similar to the blue book or excuse me, to the uh, title setting process, where if you have to distill something from um, a thousand words to 500 words, what are the salient points and what are the components that 
you think are are superfluous to um, to set that apart. I don't think that we necessarily have a charge at this point under the under the code of the law to um, decide what is true and what is not true. Um, and so I think that our summary would be much more about um, distilling salient parts and making sure that it fits under the under the word requirement as opposed to any major um, analysis of, of truth or untruth. Thank you. Can I follow up on that? So it sounds like it's less of a summary, but more of an editing to make sure it's 500 words or less. I think I, Castlewoman Black, I think it's both. Um, mm -hmm. It's, it's I, I, I think that those two things are, they go hand in hand. Um, mm -hmm. If you have something that's over the over the word limit, you have to you have to distill it down, and I think that um, that's something that we have to do. I, I I don't think that we're trying to eliminate any um, major points that somebody's trying to make, but but at the end of the day, that's what the requirement is, and so we have to we have to pull that number down. Yeah, okay. and I'm not. I'm not saying that is what you do. I just was asking the question because I wasn't clear, but I see Bianca has her hand up. Go ahead, Bianca. Yeah, real quickly regarding that process band. So once you summarize it or edit it, does it go back to the person to see if that's what they want, want to convey? Or once it's summarized, it's it and it's going forward? Um, once once we have a crack at it, that's that's what moves forward. Under under the current, under the current code. That's that's how it works. And have you ever been in a situation where there was something that was you were sure wasn't accurate and you needed to go back to the proponent and ask them about it? Or does that well, never I'm, happen? Um, thanks for the question, Councilwoman Black. I'm going to harken back to my days at the Secretary of State's office because I just haven't had this experience before in Denver um, where um, I think essentially we kind of made those made those decisions um, on our own and, and and didn't go back, but but we weren't necessarily in charge in the same way that um, the state's uh, legislative council and legislative legal services are in charge of those issues for the blue book. So, um, frankly, I, I probably don't have a great answer for you there because I just have not had that um, experience. I don't know if there are other folks from the from the clerk's office that might be able to speak to that. So Ben, we the councilwoman very rare very rare um you know a lot of the what we're talking about in, in in this process are rarities right and so i think you know when we look at you know uh, the editing and the summarizing of some of these uh, uh initiatives you know there have been instances in particular one on on the last ballot or where looking at it and reviewing it i would have thought it was false um, in 2020, there was some, uh, one in particular that I thought was false, a false description in terms of an opposition uh, statement. Um, there were a few that I thought, well, is this truly a study? Was this study done? And, you know, there was nothing that I could do about it as clerk or, or my office, right? And I think, you know, in terms of editing and summarizing, you would want to trade, stay as true as possible to the intent, but verification is not in the wheelhouse. Yeah. I mean, if somebody, if it was about sidewalks and it was about a certain kind of concrete, yeah. my folks in the elections division are not concrete experts or mm -hmm. transportation experts, right? Mm -hmm. So we rely on either the proponent or the opposition statement. And, you know, that was obvious in one of the characterizations of one of the um, opposition statements that mm -hmm. um, was in the media of recent. So, hmm. you know, that that's where it gets a little tricky. Yeah. And that's where you have the, I'm not going to use bananas because it's not necessarily bananas, but that's where you have the apples to oranges analysis and staff time and the infrastructure that exists. Right. Uh, right. With a team of researchers. But Rush I know that we're running time. Yeah. Rice Mallow budget expansion request here. Over time. I know the person who wrote that uh, opposition statement and I, so I know the source of her information. I don't know how you would have gone about trying to verify or refute it, frankly. Uh, that's a tough nut to crack. 
for sure. Thank you. Well, it just goes to show you that every one of these issues is way more complicated than it might appear. <laughs> um, okay, we've gone way over and I thank everyone who stuck with it and then we'll need to figure out some follow-up. And I know Clerk Lopez, you wanted to talk about um, signatures at the next meeting, but we didn't finish this conversation. So I guess we need to talk about how we wanna handle the next meeting and um, how to follow up with the people who are missing today. So I think in terms of, I appreciate that councilwoman and, and you know, some of the other ideas that we wanted to improve that information booklet, you know, we can have that conversation. You know, we really, you know, and we could continue that into the next meeting, but I want to make sure, you know, part of what, what's missing out of this whole conversation is petitions, right? Um, petition threshold, thresholds, you know, what does that look like? You know, is it is it the Denver of the 1960s or 1970s in terms of the population that we required some of these, you know, 100 signatures per petition gathering, right, for a candidate, let's just say, or, you know, the last time that we actually uh, change the thresholds required for petition signatures for initiated ordinances was when I was still on council, as, as you guys remember, I think in 2019 or 2018. So, you know, I think the conversation probably should happen. And then, you know, the, the notion of should petition signatures and how many should be gathered from each council district, if that's a requirement, like what was passed on the state level. So those, I think, are going to be topics that are going to take some length and some discussion and some research, frankly. And that's why I think we had this next last final meeting to be able to kind of mull those over and get some input back from it. Okay, well, so why don't say we push that out? Why don't we follow up with email to everyone and you know, things that we don't get to in this group, it doesn't mean that council can't still discuss them. Um, and I know David brought up my suggestion, which was to have um, council self-impose an earlier deadline to refer measures. Um, yeah. And so if we don't get to that, I, I can propose that to council without the recommendation of this group, because we frankly are, have run out of time. But why don't we follow up with everyone um, via email and figure out what we're going to do for the next meeting? OK. All right. Thank thanks, you. everyone. Thanks, everybody. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.